You are listening to The Bob and Kevin Show with Bob Beatty Bar and Kevin Gisheski. Each week we cover relevant tech and social issues related to technology. And more weeks than not, we're joined by special guests to add additional perspective to our topics. Our website is bobandkevin.show. And our episodes can be found on virtually any podcast network. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Just search for Bob and Kevin Show. Hey, Bob, what are we doing today? Well, Kevin, we're going to talk a little bit about build versus buy when it comes to various aspects about technology development, computing, all that good stuff. And uh, as per usual, we will probably wander and meander a little bit along the way. We don't have a special guest in studio or remote this week. So it's just me, Bob, and that guy over there. He's not really over there. He's over there in the internet universe. Say hello, Kevin. Hello, Kevin. (laughs) And why don't you help kick us off a little bit today? All right. So really what we are going to be talking about is the make versus buy, build versus buy, um, in-house versus outsource. Really, it's kind of the same sort of premise, just kind of worded differently. But before we get into all that, I do need to share kind of some of the uh, the happenings around here in rural Indiana, if you if you will, technology related. God, we need some farm sounds right now. Uh, all right, we'll put that in the show budget <laughs> uh, for the future. Some sort of can't you just can't you just record some locally? Uh, all we have locally here are are, are pigs. Um, if, if we want to get into cows, I guess, actually, I can't call them cows, so that's the wrong term. I learned one point. You can't just call bovines cows because you have steer, you have bulls, you have cows. Um, so uh, penalty for me. And then you have chickens, but we don't have any chickens around here. Um, anyway, so. <laughs> so tell uh, us what's going on in rural Indiana. So get Bob, ask me what I was doing just prior to the show. Kevin, quick question for you. What were you doing just prior to the show? Well, thanks for asking, Bob. (laughs) Just prior to the show, I was connecting my brother-in-law's grill to the internet. When you say grill, do you mean like his fancy teeth or? (laughs) Uh, Let's go with the barbecue is probably more accurate. So Uh, my my brother-in-law does, you know, like a, I don't know how many hours smoker, you know, takes some really pork shoulder smoke it for 24 hours and then you know does the whole pulled pork thing we we throw on some barbecue sauce and eat really well so yeah he had me connecting his it's one of those green egg looking things and i don't even oh, know yeah. what the brand name is on that but would you believe and you're gonna have to say yes because it does exist but would you believe that that thing has a web server built into it is it like a raspberry pi I don't know. It it is a it is a uh, external unit, so it's like a black box. You plug it in. It's got a probe that goes into the the uh, the, the vessel, if you will. And I asked him, like, oh, you know, I I definitely um, I definitely you know understand how to grill, but barbecuing is a different thing. And why would you need such a thing? And apparently, you know, because it's 24 hour cook times, you um, can leave the house and remotely monitor <laughs> your temperatures and things like right, that. Right. Because it's all about so setting and maintaining saying. temperatures, right? Yeah. So I, I don't know if what he's doing is actually smoking it, you know, barbecue. I'm, I'm such a novice. You know, I, I know how to grill, which is basically sear meat over a short amount of time. Barbecuing is a whole foreign concept to me. So does it have software that like puts the hole in the port on the firewall already or? Oh man, it's like you were sitting there watching the happening. So getting it to work on the LAN was a piece of cake, but getting it to work from your phone outside the LAN, you know, over the internet, that was a a little tiny bit of networking um, work. So you're right. I had to uh, poke a hole in the firewall on a certain port 
go to the router, do a port forwarding, and bada bing, bada boom, Chrome will connect you to the web server inside the barbecue. So how he must have a pretty non-standard router then because a lot of the consumer routers that they're giving people like through, you know, fill in cable provider name here, they don't give you that capability anymore to open up holes and forward ports and whatnot. Um, you know, I, every router that I've ever had, you've got that ability because the, the classic example is you want to run your own web server, you know, at your house, you know, out of the closet. And I've had to do a port 80 forwarding of course nowadays. We'll want to do port 443, but nowadays you don't even want to do that. You just want to throw your shit in the cloud and <laughs> call it good. <laughs> so that's what you want to do. Well, my most recent, like it, through my provider Comcast, I had to go with a third party modem slash router to get that ability because they don't allow consumers to do that anymore. Ooh, so that's probably a function of Comcast or Time you know, Time Warner. Yeah, I just assumed that most of the other providers were hopping on board with really limiting what their end users could do because obviously know, the more ports you can open, the more bandwidth you can take. That's a great segue because you, you may want to ask another question, Bob. Go ahead, Bob. Ask me how hard is it to get internet out in rural sticks oh this is actually a very timely question that is a good one um so hey i was thinking about this kevin how hard is it to actually get (laughs) internet where you are well bob that's a great question thanks for asking (laughs) unprompted um so in town you know we have like eight thousand people and we have some cable motor options and that's your most reliable bang for the buck We've got some DSL options that tops out at 10 meg. That's right, 10 meg down and maybe like 400K up. And so when you get outside the the city center, and I'm talking like half a mile outside of town, you lose cable internet instantly as an option. Uh, DSL, um, you might have that option. And it and it degrades, you know. I was gonna say you're most likely you're too far from the box, right? Exactly. So now you're contending with that. And so my brother-in-law, what he actually has is a line of sight internet uh, setup. So, so not center, satellite, but kind of like local line of sight. Is that how that works? Exactly. So it looks like a satellite dish. And so if you if you were to stand in his front yard and look towards town, you would see a I don't know a 200 foot cell tower type thing. And it has um, receivers on it. So you basically are communicating with another dish on the other side. And it's a point-to-point internet relay, for lack of a better term. What's the latency like on that? Uh, You know, you have some great questions because that was my first question for him. So in the military, when I did satellite communications, to go up to a satellite and back down, you have a 500 millisecond latency. And that's just a deal killer for gaming, even VoIP calls, you know, can be awkward. Um, For us non-metric folk, that's a half second, right? That is a half second, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Because a satellite, geosynchronous satellite is 22,500 miles from uh, from the equator all the way out there. So speed of light is fast, but it's, you know, not as fast as you'd want it to be. Well, it still takes time, sure. Sure. It does. So if we go back to his line of sight type stuff, um, he's actually in the 60 to 70 millisecond range, which isn't bad for that at all. In fact, you know, on a hard wire cable modem, I was only getting mm, 30 millis- thirty to 50, you know, depending on saturation of the network. Oh, wow. So I've got my, wow, I'm really fast here then. Because even like on wireless in the house i get like sub 10 and that's like i'll get a nines on wireless but i've paid a lot for my gear too and and is that when you do like a speed test to an external network and back you're getting that low that's that's yeah good my son gets a lot of that feedback through his online gaming so (laughs) gotcha so anyway, um, those were the uh, predecessors to today's show that I was involved in. Um, who knows, or who knew that you can control and monitor? It's not just monitoring. You can actually turn the thing on and off and change the temperature remotely, or the, the barbecue that is. And then to get the internet to this remote location where or he is uh, employing a line of sight relay, and it's uh, 
that's what we do out here, Bob. We, so is we, there uh, an app on the phone? Like you got the green egg app. Is that how no, that works? No, nope. it is just a, it's literally a web server. Oh, it's a web a, server. Okay. Yeah. With yeah, a web, so. web page serving pages. And when you do your command, it goes back to the web server and it uh, affects the hardware. How would you rate the GUI for that web interface? Well, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the best, I would rate it a negative five. Ooh, so it's it's got room for <laughs> it's improvement. Pretty, it's, it is, yeah, I'll, I'll share a screenshot with you one day. It is, yeah, it's, it's basically tables. You know, it's terrible. So is this an aftermarket thing that you can buy that works with your green egg? Or is this something that you can actually buy as a component when you purchase your green egg from the... I, Manufacturer. I believe it's the latter, and uh, I don't know that for sure, so fact checkers will have to check me on that, but I'm pretty sure he went with the Cadillac version of the Green Egg. And that, it, that's is there a possibility, and this kind of is a little bit of a bridge segue, that there is an aftermarket for, uh, I don't even know what you'd call it, uh, Smokinator 2000? <laughs> You mean a better, like a third-party app that would be even better than this one? Yes. Well, I think the market would be limited due to the fact that we're basically talking about reading a thermometer and adjusting the temperature. Those are the two core functionalities, and there's only so much you can do with that. And that would be that would be dependent upon the manufacturers of these smokers having an API for third-party to be able to control them. Yes, and uh, in true um, form with the way things go these days, I'm sure those things have almost no security on them, and they are probably part of a botnet. So next time a DDoS happens on your favorite website, it may just be the uh, built-in web server um, on your green egg army. Stealing down cycles from your green egg. Nice. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, okay. So something else is going on with you this uh, new this week. You are, and this also is kind of segue-ish to build or buy. You have a new working space. Is that true? Yeah. So mission accomplished on selling the house. Now I am in a more rural location, so my internet is not as up to snuff as you'd want it to be. And we're and testing that internet on the podcast right now, aren't we? We are, and uh, I do feel bad if my voice cuts in and out. So this is a trial run on being able to podcast from this location. But um, I did get some office space uh, in town at the local Chamber of Commerce. They basically sent me or gave me a, a place to sit, a Wi-Fi connection, uh, some coffee, and a restroom. You know, everything I need. And it has a really nice side effect that... I can walk to the coffee shop. I can stay in the coffee shop for a few hours if I want. I can walk to the yogurt store next door. I can walk to the hobby store. So it's actually really nice as a remote worker to be able to, to change my scenery from time to time. So at the remote workspace, do they provide coffee for the people who use the space? Uh, it, they have a Keurig machine, if that counts. <laughs> so um, I, I much more opt for the Dunkin' Donuts or the local coffee shop. Nice. So you could take advantage of the coffee there, but you opt not to. That is correct. I'm, uh, I'm not really a coffee snob uh, type, but I really am trying to step away from Keurig and... It's not so much the environmental impact that we've heard of, which that is kind of important. Um, but it's also, I, I don't know, I just like freshly cut coffee, ground coffee, I guess, not cut. But Okay, but just for the record, kind of you did preface I, I really that statement it. by saying you're not a coffee snob. <laughs> hmm, so maybe I just qualified myself as one. Whatever, don't at me. I think a lot of us are coffee snobs, so uh, don't worry about it. So that could be our first build versus buy, though, because as an independent contractor, or I guess you're not, you're just a remote worker. But as a remote worker, you would have the, you could have the option to get your own office space, correct? I could, but my options are severely limited in a small town. I mean, it's, we're not exactly a cosmopolitan, super hipster 
town. We're we're typical small town America, and uh, I was actually surprised there was anywhere willing to give me a desk and a Wi-Fi connection. And that is pretty progressive because it's in your small town, not like the greater Fort Wayne metropolitan area, correct? Yeah, I could drive over to Fort Wayne, which is about a 20 minute drive each way. Twenty, Actually, probably about 30 because I'm going to the city center. Then I have to pay for my own parking, um, which is a monthly rate. And then I would be, you know, kind of in a, a pretty, they got some pretty nice ones in Fort Wayne. It's very hipster, um, but it's just a hassle. I guess I've, what I have turned into a snob is a commute snob. I really hate commuting. I really hate it. <laughs> Well, before we cross into, I feel like we're starting to talk a little bit of a workshop talk here. It's probably good to drop in uh, the disclaimer that the thoughts and opinions of Bob primarily, but also Kevin on the Bob and Kevin show are exclusively the thoughts of Bob and Kevin and the opinions as well. So, all right. So now that we've got that out of the way, (laughs) um, your employer, much like my employer, probably would not pay to have an office space though, right? Um, I could probably ask, but I also sometimes look at myself going, you know what? I could work from home. Going to a co-working space is a personal choice and I don't necessarily, it's not an, a, a, an expense that's absolutely needed. It's more of a want uh, and right now, in a situation, so I brought the situation on myself. You know, I sold my house, and I'm kind of, you know, need a place. So that's, it, it's it's walking that line where yes, your employer, you know, why don't you do it? You know, ask them. Well, uh, yeah, I could work out of, you know, where I'm at right now and have, you know, not the best internet. And I don't know. What do you think in well, that situation? I was actually just really pondering this when you're talking about that because, so for me, for example, there is office space that I could be going to course it's a 90 minute commute each way but so i would guess that my company would not be willing to you know subsidize a co-working space or any kind of like remote office other than my own because of that but you are slightly in a different situation because it's not like you have corporate offices nearby yeah um I would like to go on record and say I love my job. Um, I have zero complaints about it. I love the remote worker lifestyle. I love the fact that I can flex time as needed. Um, I love the fact that I don't work overtime. So when this came up that I wanted or that I kind of needed to do co-working, I I felt that it was, you know, a problem I brought on myself and I solved it myself and it's a temporary situation and I don't feel like my employer owes me anything in this situation at all. Right. And I just also want to echo a lot of those same thoughts that Kevin just shared, not being a copycat or a kiss ass. I just want to make sure that it's known (laughs) that I'm not complaining about my job in any way, shape or form either. But like, let's take that part out of the equation. So let's just think about the remote worker. So you can be the kind of worker that flourishes and is highly productive in a home office. But you might be a remote worker, like in your situation, who has no home office nearby, who isn't as productive in a home office environment as they could be in a co-working space or an, an office space. That I mean, so wouldn't it be possible that, like, it would be, I don't want to say unfair, but it might not be the best in the best interest of the company to keep a remote worker working in a non-productive environment. So uh, like yeah, no, subsidized I, I, co-working I, might make sense then. I don't know. It's a question. It's, it's, it's highly dependent on the worker probably. I mean, I can be productive in a coffee shop. That's super noisy. When I put on the headphones, all that goes away. I can be unproductive sometimes during the school year when the kids are during the summer when the kids are out and uh, I'm the de facto person has to watch them just because every other option, you know, kind of, you know, had other options <laughs> themselves. Um, so it, it depends on the day. I mean, I'm definitely, you know, kind of out of my element right now and uh, co-working space for me made sense to buy an insurance policy on myself that, you know, I need to be able to have a dedicated focus space and it's a trial basis to be honest so (laughs) if it works out i'll keep going if not i will try something else so handful of days into the experience 
How would you rate this experience? Um, I scare people there um, because I'm in an area where nobody has seen anyone for months, if not years. So I'm the only coworker there. Everyone else has kind of like been there for a long time. So when I walk past and they see me sitting there, sometimes I startle them because they're like, whoa, my gosh, didn't expect somebody to be sitting there. And <laughs> so that's... Oh, so you don't scare them with your persona or your personality. You literally frighten them because they're not used to seeing a body in the space. Yes, that's correct. Uh, I will scare them with my persona, uh, probably starting next week as I open up more to them. Yes. So. <laughs> so what has been the experience of having to like, you know, put on pants and stuff like that? You know, uh, no change because every day as a remote worker, I have to shower. I have to um, have my routine and I have to go through the motions like I would normally because I got to feel like I'm going to work. If, if I don't shower and don't get like ready, I call that a Saturday and I, my mind's just not in it. So, so part of your routine you're saying is pants. So, I, I, <laughs> yes. So are you a shorts guy at all? Like, do you have to wear like business casual to go to this remote workspace or? Um, so I call Rome, jeans business casual, by the way. <laughs> When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Um, so when I go to Denver, you know, it's jeans and a button shirt. Um, when I'm here at the house, uh, I, you know, just super casual. Now, I did notice at the co-working space that they're actually wearing m more. I am a bit underdressed compared to some of them, but other ones aren't. So, you know, it's jeans and a shirt. So I don't really think I'm... Uh, trashing up the place too much by wearing a button shirt and some jeans in there. And that's usually what I do. See, I can't stand wearing long pants or shoes. So I am shorts and barefoot or flip flops pretty much all year round. You know, I'm a big flip flop person. However, uh, it's just sometimes like in this particular case that I'm, I'm just, you know, I need to go close toe here. And uh, anyway, that's oh, that would kill me. All right. So, <laughs> I want to swing it back to build versus buy. And I'm going to try to be like crazy good at this circular thing. And I want to just throw out a scenario and we'll see how it goes. So I'm your brother and he's like, he, you know, I just got that smoker and I'm like, man, it would be great if there was a computer that could allow me to control the smoker from a remote location anywhere via my phone or, you know, someone else's internet connection. And you would say, well, yeah, I heard that they sell those green egg. You know, you can just buy it. And me as your brother says, mm, nope, I don't, that one's terrible. I've read a bunch of bad reviews on it. The UI is stupid. I think we should build a better one. What do you say? <laughs> Well, based on that setup, I would say <laughs> neither one of us are getting, uh, you know, any sort of revenue on it. We're not building the product for mass consumption. And I would definitely go with, yeah, what can I find on the internet? But definitely isn't that with. really what it boils down to? Isn't that your classic build versus buy scenario? Because, um, well, you know, I would like to counter your scenario with another scenario, one that I've actually asked you about. So you're going to have to access the memory banks here. So do, 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 do. once upon a time, I said, hey, Bob, have you ever used a PDF library? Because it seems like PDFs are hard in .NET. And if they're not necessarily hard, there's just a lot of nuances. There's a lot of tribal knowledge. And I just don't want to have to deal with that. Should, should I? Do you have any recommendations for a PDF library before I try to make one? And you would say. I do remember that conversation and I love this conversation because I found a library that I actually really love. And so that would be a situation for me where 99.9% .9 of my needs, the cheap $199 license or whatever it was for that PDF library totally outweighed the time and cost that it would take for me to build one. So I recommended buy in that scenario. All right. But uh, I know there's a buck coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, um, we actually, I think, took you up on that advice and selected the same 
um, uh, library that you recommended. And I, I, as a side note, I must say, there's a lot of money in PDFs uh, in as far as libraries, because there's almost nothing open source out there. Correct. Um, and if it is, it's very shallow in terms of features. And there's not a whole lot of like built in or at least documented. This is what a PDF is. This is how you do one go because it seems like there's different formats and I don't know. I can't back that up with any claims. I don't, does Adobe own the PDF format somehow? Um, is it an open standard? I'm not sure actually. Yeah. I think there's actually a long story behind that. Um, I think that at one time it was completely proprietary and owned by Adobe. We will definitely need to have fact checkers on this, but um, then I think that it had to go. It's like very similar to the MP3 story, I think. Uh, in, in what way? Like who the, owns MP3 or? Exactly. Where it was at one time, it was going to be proprietary and there was going to be huge licensing fees, I think. Wasn't that MP3? Uh, I don't know. For me, and then it became public domain. Faster. Or maybe it was, the M, it was the MPEG format in general, I think, that went through something like that. So, but I think that PDF... I think that there's different flavors of PDF and some of them are completely open and then also compatible with the Adobe version of it. I believe I could totally be talking out of my ass right now. I'm not sure. So I have a, uh, I have a disclosure, I guess, or a statement to make about make versus buy in a perfect world. I would be unbiased and go, you know what, make or buy, it doesn't matter. Let me hear the facts so we can make a, a sane decision. And the, the truth is, is I'm actually very biased to, well, what is it that we need? And then I'm instantly going, yeah, I'd like to build that, you know? Uh, and, and I tend to shade towards build versus buy in a lot of scenarios. And I was wondering if, if um, you had any sort of, you know, one way or the other on on make or buy oh without a doubt i am surprise surprise to all of our regular listeners i'm completely on the opposite end of the spectrum from kevin <laughs> and uh i am mostly a buy guy because really what it boils down to is uh skill time um and uh yeah just skill and time i don't have the same level of skill that you do and uh my time tends to get a little sucked in different directions other than development. So I did a little show research to figure out, you know what? Make versus buy a lot of times comes down to kind of like this unwritten decision-making process that has a lot to do with your organizational structure, your skills, blah, blah, blah. I found a few articles and one it's on uh, inc.com and we'll probably have to link to it now in our show notes, but it's got 10 factors affecting choice. And if you will, uh, let's kind of go through the list here and talk through them a tiny bit. Um, so one factor is, is the thing that needs to be made or bought, how central is it to your actual product that you're making? Meaning, you know, it, it, can, can we sell this product or, or can we build this site without the thing? How critical is it? And I think that's kind of a big deal, you know, in terms of, well, if it's a big deal, we might need to get our arms around this because it's, you know, this is the essence of what we're doing. And we may not want to trust, you know, maybe it's a trust factor to a third party to be able to pull this off. What do you think about um, that sort of concept? Well, when you started to outline it, I was like, well, so what does a yes indicate? Does a yes indicate build or buy? But when you put the trust aspect on it, so if it's central to your product, if it's critical to your product, buying it probably wouldn't make sense because that means that you're going to have to mark up something that's already out there and maybe not even add much feature set to it. So, uh, yeah, I guess that if it's critical, then it does tend to lead toward build so not to pick on any particular platforms but let's say wordpress and braco you know ruby on well, i don't know if rails is applicable but let's let's say you no because you just up, did two cms's and an actual development platform so yes, i totally crossed the streams there <laughs> I, I owe a fine um so you know let's go with wordpress and braco so 
those are very good one size fits many uh, solutions, but probably neither one are very good at what you specifically need without extending them in some shape, way, or form, whether it be your own front end using a plug in from somewhere else or building that extens uh, that extensibility. So in, in that case, and a lot of people do use those as the central part of, you know, the product. Um, do we immediately just go with, well, we're not going to make a CMS. We're, we're going to buy, oh, for lack of term, buy, even though they're free. Uh, we're going to buy those. Um, so let's start with that. Would you ever make your own CMS? I actually have made my own CMS. I think most developers that are anywhere past the age of probably 30-ish at this point were part of the generation where CMSs weren't very prevalent like they are today. So you kind of had to build your own at least at one point because the feature set of everything else was so limited. So no, I would never build a CMS today, but I'm a little challenged when we talk about like you'd frame that under extensibility and both of those, both of those content management systems, unless you are going with a prepackaged package solution of those, you pretty much have to extend them to get them to do anything. You know, WordPress, yeah, you can pick a theme and go, but really for the most part, yes, it's possible to do that with Umbraco, but it's not very practical. So um, Umbraco is more of a, we'll get you started. And it's, it's essentially Tinker Toys or Legos where you're going to just, you're definitely going to build on it, but out of the box, there's just a bunch of pieces. Boy, right. I'm you're sure not building the CMS, going. but <laughs> yeah, you're not building the CMS, but you're still building the website that, is the result. WordPress, right. not when so you much. Download, you can point click and be done. Yeah, when you download WordPress, you get it. And then if 10 plugins later, you pre and, and a theme later, you're you're kind of like, all right, what are we doing after lunch? Umbraco is more of the tortoise and hare where it's the tortoise with Umbraco, and that's not at all a slight because I think slow and steady wins this race because let's start here and and add things and it'll definitely take you longer, but you are getting a custom website with a kind of boost to get you started. I mean, you're, let's, let's, let's get you to step three or five of 10 um, by installing Embraco, but you still have five steps to go with WordPress. You start almost at step seven and then eight, nine and 10 are, are just downloads. And what I would say is probably a better comparison. Like I would, you could still do a build versus buy. Buy would be like a Wix or, you know, one of the other online site builders. And then that would be your buy situation. And then build would be like an Umbraco. Totally agree because, and full disclosure, I haven't used a Wix. It's almost like I, I would have to hand in my developer card if I did. I, and, and I realized, yes, I could build a blog and I'm just totally like, you know, probably like over uh, judging Wix. But I would assume that Wix is less extensible than WordPress and Umbraco. Yeah, no, it's not extensible at all. You're pretty much using components in like you're using their canned components and then you are pretty much stylizing things just with colors and imagery. Um, but it is very drag and drop that way. Now, the cool thing though, and I think we do sell a Wix type, you know, solution a little short, they have that same mentality for e-commerce though. So when you talk build versus buy, I think e-commerce is a big situation for build versus buy. So the one that comes to mind that's the obvious buy option is Shopify or even eBay to in a, you know, kind of a lesser extent, but Shopify, if, if you need um, e-commerce and I've had people come to me, Hey, I need to sell stuff online. And I say, okay, dude, you, do you know what you're asking for? If you want me to build you something custom, I know the litany of things that I'm going to have to do for you. And that's a long, a lot of time and time is money. Can you start with Shopify and see if that will meet your needs? That is my first gut reaction to most of my friends. Yeah. What's and uh, the cool thing about Shopify, oh no, I'm a huge fan of Shopify. The cool thing about Shopify is you can make that 
as complex and templated as you want to because they've got tons of great powerful hooks and they've got their own templating language. So you've got the under the hood, you know, add to your cart, you know, it could be subscription based. It could be just one off product based. You know, they've got a marketing back end as well, but I mean, you can, you can tweak that thing till the cows come home if you want, but I mean, it is a great buy, but you could also treat it as a build almost if you wanted to. If I had to, if I had to commit to one or the other, I would definitely go with it. It's, it's a buy option. So the build option, I think, would be more like in Embracolin, T-Commerce, uh, U-Commerce, Marcello. Um, outside of Embraco, you're looking at Nop Commerce, uh, Magento, uh, things along that line where it's, you know, or even Stripe and Braintree where it's just a provider and you build you you build your own cart even. Right. That's the true build in my mind. I still think a lot of those other products that we mentioned, I think they they market themselves as buys, not builds. So maybe maybe we're not such a binary choice, build versus buy. It might be buy-ish and build-ish and <laughs> build some and buy some. Well, you know. I think that's the nature of who we are as people though. But if you take if you take our level of expertise out of the equation, it's going to be a much more cut and dry decision for like a small business owner. You know, can I fire up a Wix and get e-commerce? Cause you can do that with Wix as well. Or am I going to go out and buy a developer to do something custom for me? So I've had local politicians come to me, Hey, can you make me a website? And the first thing I say to them is, well, do you have a budget? You know, election Elections usually have, campaigns usually have money. And basically like, nope, we spend it all on signs. Okay, you might want to go with a 495 Wix site for a month, <laughs> you know, because, you know, that's probably going to do what you need. Or before we even get there, I say, you know what, have you just start with a Facebook page? And yes, I know I'm advocating Facebook, but, you know, the, the cost there is is pretty good ROI, you know, for anyone. I've actually made that recommendation um, much more in my freelance days than currently, but you know, you always get that, you know, you're the guy in the family who's, you know, <laughs> oh, you know how to build websites, you know, can you build me a website or my buddy needs a website? And I'm like, well, what does it need to do? Because Facebook gets it done a lot. And I know we both hate that we're pumping this Facebook thing, but it is an actual great service that they provide and, and it gets you a lot of visibility. It's not just you know, I get really depressed when people want to build a website and then they have no plan of how to drive eyes to it. So I'm going to hijack our current conversation. So we'll put the pin down. We'll we'll return the stat call back to this location. You'd mentioned the guy in the family who can do X. So I have a personal rule that I had to develop a few years, probably eight years ago. I, I won't do business with family members. And the reason is, is, um, I just find that it's just kind of weird dynamic because if I'm going to do business with somebody, um, I want the option to be able to fire them. (laughs) So you can't fire a family member very easily without being an awkward Thanksgiving or Christmas. And so what that doesn't mean I don't help them. What it does mean is they say, look, I've got some extra time. I can help you out here. This is as much time as I got, but that's all I can give you. And it's free. And, that's best I can do, but I'm going to, you know, I can help you, but it's going to be free, but I won't build you a whole website, but I'll give you all this consulting, like go start a Facebook, go onto Wix, yada, yada, yada. But I actually won't do business with the family. But where do you draw the line on business with the family? Because earlier in the conversation, you did networking and uh, hardware installation. (laughs) Right. But not for a fee for, for basically, you know, Hey, you know, once you get this thing going, I'm going to be, I want some of that uh, pulled pork, you know, coming my way. Well, I guess when you say business for family, I automatically assume that it's free. It's my, my professional service with no fee attached. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, I've had a lot of family members ask me, so how much that run me? I'm like, well, first off your family, I don't, I don't, I don't charge family. If, If I can help you, it's free, but the net effect here is it's going to be very limited <laughs> and help. What you're really going to get out of me is, okay, if you need your printer fix, you need your network, you know, set up great, you know, I'll come over. No problem. I'll spend a little time. But if you need me to do stuff that I do in my professional life, like, you know, it takes weeks, hours, you know, real project management, there's no way. I'll just kindly give them advice for free and then send them on their way. 
Right. I think that's a, I think that's a good call. Okay. So now we can return from that um, method and come back to our uh, make versus buy. So going down this list here. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say we only hit number one. <laughs> So I'm not going to be able to hit all 10. I don't. So I'm going to cherry pick a few. One of them on the list was confidentiality. So confidentiality is kind of important because you can't just outsource something because you're like, well, we need more effort and time because if, if it's an HR project, you don't exactly want somebody who isn't in the circle of trust to get access to sensitive information or, or whatever it is you're doing. Um, putting in back doors, you know, who knows? So you might want to keep those cards close to you. And if you do um, have that trust with them, you know. um, That trust usually comes in the form of signed legal documents, by the way. It does. But I think it does affect make versus buy because if you don't have anyone you trust, (laughs) you're going to be making that yourself. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned the HR aspect of it, though, because we do, I mean, I come across this a lot professionally where a client and that there's, okay, so let's first say there's a huge vendor pool of, well, not huge, but a decent sized vendor pool. And it's always growing and changing of companies that provide like HR management software. And that's, that really deals with dealing with people's information. So it does get really like down to that trust thing. But to build a system like that is a, very risky, right? Well, it, it, it's risky, but it's also a, a significant financial commitment on both parties. So, you know, there's companies out there that sell it and you think the price is kind of astronomical for what they're selling. But the fact that that you don't have to build it from scratch, you're still looking at a fraction of the total cost. So, so and so most of those are subscription models, too, which kind of drives me nuts a little bit. But I get it. You got to make money, but that trust thing is big, but the, but you, the trust with the price, unfortunately is bigger. Well, yeah, the more risk, the more the cost. I, th- I think those are directly related. And another item on this list is um, unique uh, capabilities. So either you have these certain capabilities in-house or this third party that you want to acquire has these abilities. Um, things like HIPAA, um, gosh, I, if I were going to write my own software, I had to do with medical information. I, you know, I think somebody should take me out back and, and beat me because you can't, like, you couldn't, you couldn't get enough malpractice insurance to do it. Right. And, and I think your, your knowledge of your team, you know, what, what can your, what is your team qualified to do? And can we realistically do this in-house and is Chances are is no, and you're going to have to find that vendor who's got these qualifications, who's basically done this before. And I think uh, in in the insurance business, it's called uh, transference or mitigation. So you're transferring the risk to this third party because they, you know, know what they're doing and we do not. So I think that has a lot to do with make versus buy. Yeah. And that always makes for such an awkward like business relationship too. It's kind of like, well, if I was the buying party, I'd be like, well, what do we need you for if we're going to company, you know, XYZ? So, yeah, that's always weird, too. So, I think that another classic uh, bullet point on here is time to market. And so, the, the mythical man month, I think we may have talked about that, but <laughs> it's basically when, you know, a project manager says, oh, we've got extra work to do. Well, let me just hire X number more people and we'll be done in X, you know, whatever the work is divided by X and will be done that much quicker, right? And that is a fallacy uh, that I believe in, or I believe that it is a fallacy. <laughs> wow, I just... If this is a fallacy that I strongly believe in, even <laughs> though it's a fallacy. Wait, oh, wow. what? Um, so what I'm saying is the mythical We're man against month. against it. We don't yeah, believe exactly. in the mythical man month. Exactly. Or we believe that it's a myth. Oh, this Correct. is so confusing. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, you could you can outsource um, something, but just because they throw a hundred developers on it does not mean you're going to get it that much nope. quicker. You will not get it a hundred times faster. In Sorry. fact, I am more of an advocate of a two to three, maybe four person team. I think that's your most productive unit. And I think you can take a unit of that size and delegate to them 
uh, specific tasks and uh, you give another team also tasks. And uh, I think getting any bigger than that, you're just kind of getting in your own way. So back to time to market, um, if that's an important thing to you, um, uh, gosh, there's a good chance you probably don't have capacity internally, but even that third party, do they have capacity? And I would always love to know like, okay, what is, what is your plan to hit this deadline? What is your strategy? And if they say, oh, we're going to look overseas and we're going to hire, you know, basically a coding factory to get this done. That's also a red flag for me too. So um, time to market is important, but it's also mm, sometimes damned if you do, damned if you don't. Sometimes you're just like, you know, if we just do it internally, we'll get it done quicker. I think that's what a lot of shops default to. We think we are invincible. We can just get it done. Um, but I've also seen where just sending the project out um, is helpful. So when I worked at one company, we were just buried and we said, hey, we, we need some help and here's the requirements. As long as it does this, how it works inside is your problem, not ours. And it worked out great. So, what's so obviously there wasn't so much of that trust concern. You just needed the correct output based on the input. Yeah, but the risk was low because it was fairly non-sensitive. It was marketing materials. It's like, you know what? this is the inputs and as long as the outputs like this we have success right it wasn't it wasn't mission critical data right so trust trust seems to be a theme here recurring right so oh i think that's big because usually when you're i mean in both situ unless you're building it internally if you're buying something that's already made there's a lot of trust in place and if you're buying a build team basically an external build team trust also so when you when you hire that external build team in your mind what is the best way to make sure you get what you're paying for i guess and i don't mean like like efficiency of cost really it's like okay we need you to build this what what do you think the best way to keep that team on track with the vision is well Without a doubt for me, the biggest consideration in any project, I don't care if you're using internal folks, external resources, external agencies, it, you need to have master communicators at the helm. You know, there needs to be a point of contact and hopefully as minimal as possible, the, the number of points of contact and people who can synthesize and communicate effectively. So from the, from the purchasing side, these are the specifications of the thing that we're purchasing from you. From the, from the supplier side, the people that are actually building communication of how the project's going to be divided up to bring that to spec or that spec to life. And then just great back and forth, you know, and it can be push and pull. It just needs to be bi-directional communication to make sure that everything is staying on track with the original spec. I mean, there's a lot of responsibility there. It's not just, hey, here, we need this thing, go build it. That never works. So communication is so important, I think. And I'm, I'm currently on a long running um, big project and I'm in the day-to-day -day weeds, so to speak. And so it's easy for me to just lose track of what, what the big picture is. And so, Thankfully, I have a really good uh, program manager and she she will gut check me a lot and I, uh, I'm able to rubber duck a bit and, and bounce ideas off her and um, it's a really good relationship. And then we have then the stakeholder, the client, um, he's got you know his vision of what it should do and we do uh, weekly demos uh, just to make sure that A, we're actually doing something and B the things that we are doing are um, <laughs> what they actually asked for. So, uh, so far so good. Um, I've also been in situations where there's just too many layers of, of managers, too many cooks in the kitchen. If right. You will. Right. And that was about a couple of years back where it's just like, we've had everyone, too many people have an opinion and nobody is taking uh, charge in, in creating a vision and direction. So um, 
there's many things that can go wrong with communication, but if you decide to go with that external buy and that can manifest on buying something off the shelf or like you said, doing that build team, communication is a big deal. Um, so yeah, you and I've talked about this before, a, a great project manager worth their weight in gold. I mean, it, it can, it can make or break even a buy. It could make or break, you know, and one who understands, you know, the UI is one thing, uh, the back ends, another thing, um, you know, how do we test these things? Uh, how do we do, chop up the, uh, the units of work for, for each task? You know, uh, how do we pound the scope in so this sprint isn't just overloaded? How do we make sure that we don't get the sprint done in one day in on a seven day sprint or a two weeks, right? You know, um, what do we do when that happens? When something proves false, uh, you know, this thing takes longer, this thing takes shorter. Uh, this new feature affects those three over there. That should be already kind of, you know, air quotes done, but no longer is that the case. So yeah, I'm totally with you. A, a project slash program manager for me is definitely worth their weight in gold. And I think in a perfect world, and I know this doesn't exist very often, but in a perfect world, you would want complete separation of interest between the person who books the business and the person who manages the business after it's booked. But in so many situations, that is totally a, a compressed and compromised dual role individual. And it just makes project management very difficult when you're also responsible for the the visionary sale of the product. <laughs> so I, I worked at a wireless phone company many years ago and we, we had a lot of make or buy decisions and I was a very greenhorn developer and I, w I always wanted to make our own point of sale system and uh, probably rightly so management says, I don't think so, Kevin, <laughs> that's way tougher than you think it is. And they're totally right. Um, <laughs> 10 years ago, I'd have been, or eight years ago, I guess it was, they, I would have been just like tsunamied by the, the level of effort required. So we went with a third party option. The license was something on the order of 20 to $30,000 a month. Uh, oh. believe that. <laughs> but when you have 600 stores and you divide the costs, you know, right. by 600, it actually isn't too crazy. So you can imagine the amount of revenue coming in on this model. The real rub though was eventually this, we were, we were the big fish. We were funding this third party, you know, at that rate, we're, we are, we are a whale to them. Right. But, but eventually a lot of times those third parties will say, you know what, thanks for the whale money. Now we've pivoted our product a bit to be more of a one size fits many and when you guys come to us and say you have a specific use case, we're not going to be so friendly and say, yeah, we'll, we'll update our software for you. Because now we've got 100 other clients, 20 of which are whales. And if we add this one feature for you, these other guys over here may not be so happy about this feature, air quotes. And our, and our platform really doesn't handle specific features for specific clients. So long story short, that company now has, or, or they built their own point of sale software and dropped the, the vendor. So um, is there a question on that list that kind of says, you know, like, are you going to be the, I don't even know how you'd phrase it, but that seems to be like a really good question to ask when you're going into build versus buy. Like that would be one of the matrix boxes to tick. You know, are you going to be a whale or are you going to be, you know, a Joe customer? Yeah, because when you're when you're basically bootstrapping the company um, that's doing this, you have a lot of input that that you demand that they respond to. And I know it seems weird, but when you're the whale and you know you're the whale, you kind of can be choosy and, <laughs> and uh, demanding. Um, but when that equation changes and they no longer need you because you bootstrap them into many whales and you're just yet another whale. You know, you lose that influence. And I think the moral of the story here is you may be buying today, but in the future, the business may demand that you be making 
in the future in order right. to adapt to the ever changing market. Wow. So, so are there any other questions on there that are interesting? Um, I'll just read them off as rapid fire. So the 10 factors affecting choice are centrality to the whole product, critical to performance, unique third-party capabilities, development independence, internal competency alignment. I don't even know what that means. Confidentiality. That's, that's kind of a trust thing. Complementor availability. Uh, I have no idea what that means. Uh, customer ownership, price sensitivity, and time to market. So those are the 10 factors. So I don't know if any of those kind of emote. Well, that or- customer ownership is a big one too, though, because it's kind of like, you know, you come across that a lot, um, especially in agency life. Like if I build something for you, who owns that thing that I built for you? Oh, that's, that's very important because, um, yeah, because... Uh, agency A could build software and realize that there's a potential for this software for many markets, white label it. And then wait a second, you built it. You built that software on our budget and we didn't say you could, you know, relicense it, so to speak. So that's very important. I think when hiring somebody, what's who owns the code and what is the people who physically possess it allowed to do with said code? Is there some sort of no compete? You can't sell the same project product to one of our competitors. You know, that's a very good question. Well, it's funny because it's not even limited to code. I mean, back when I started working in the agency world years and years and years, decades ago now, unfortunately, um, we would get calls all the time from customers, you know, confirming. So when we get our brochure printed, who owns the files? And we're like, oh, they're yours. We don't want them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it, it, that is a tale as old as time. But there's some agencies that retain ownership on the end product, which is bizarre to me. So, I think it is too because um, I worked at an agency. Uh, the agency is no longer with us. The One of the clients sought me out after the fact and said, hey, can you help me out? And I said, well, sure, but where's your source code? And they said, what's source code? And so they had a, a live production website, but they did not have the source, nor did the agency exist anymore that, that they hired. Oh. So lesson learned here, if, if, if somebody hires somebody, um, I would recommend an ownership you know, discussion at the very least, because you, you may actually not own your code for a break in rate, which I wouldn't do that. I would rather pay the full rate and own my stuff. And what I would recommend uh, happen is, um, you know, we could throw it in our GitHub or I can throw it in your GitHub. And if the, the client says, well, what's a GitHub? <laughs> as a fiduci- I feel like I have a fiduciary responsibility to say it's source control. I would recommend you set up here. I can help you set it up. It's going to be your credit card and we'll throw it all there. And if you want to fire us in the future, this will be helpful. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So did we solve build versus buy? No, but did we really think we were going to? No, because I think that's an ever, that's an ongoing theme for us is that we, we just, we just bring debate to the table and leave it to the listener to decide. So uh, again, full disclosure, I love to build and tinker because heck, I'm a creative type and, and I like to build stuff. But I think I'm, I'm pretty good at knowing my limits and going, okay, I think it's nuts to build my own PDF library, especially after seeing that there's limited options out there as far as OSS goes and everything seems to be a paid option. Um, Spidey Scent says this must be hard. <laughs> so ask, and, and of course I asked, you know, my, my cohorts, you know, Hey Bob, what do you think about PDF stuff? Do you, what do you use? And I did, uh, outside of just you on Twitter and, and, you know, I definitely said, Ooh, that was a good one. I'm glad I did not try to in, reinvent that wheel, <laughs> but I will tell you, I'm not afraid to reinvent wheels. You know, a lot of times that term is like, Oh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. You know what? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we absolutely do. Oh, this reminds me. Every now and then you see on Twitter, people will say something to the effect of, you shouldn't be using a framework. You should be writing it yourself. So it's almost like 
we've gone from a society where we, we should not re reinvent any wheel, well, not society, a community of programmers. We shouldn't reinvent, reinvent every wheel or any wheel. You should always try a library first. To I see a lot of pushback lately to people are saying, you should be writing that yourself. You shouldn't be relying on an entire library for 3% of its actual functionality. You should be, and, and I don't know if I disagree with that, right? Why should I download a thousand lines of code so I can use 20 of them? Right. And I don't know if we can solve that either, and we won't today. <laughs> no. no, but I think that is a topic to bring up again, and I think, um, I think that would be a good one with a guest who has a strong opinion. That would be interesting. Yeah, so um, everyone should always check whether or not building is the right option. And everyone should always probably check that, well, be, just because I always use Bootstrap in every project, you know, one day maybe I should question that. And it's very possible, yes, we're going to keep using it. And that's fine too, <laughs> you know, because that's fine. I always find myself saying, just because I can, does that mean I should? Yeah, um, I think that people love to use it, and so do I, um, because that's a very, a lot of those sayings that were vague and they're like so applicable to so many things <laughs> and like saying something without saying anything. It's very like, yeah, I see what you're saying. That's very clever, but what does it mean? You I do know? drop that one in meetings all the time, and I know that some people think he has no clue what he's talking about. <laughs> Um, so I think, uh, make versus buy has a lot of internal bias, you know, a lot of trust issues, you know, a lot of, uh, I know people who won't use Google, you know, maps because they don't trust Google. They'll use Bing, you know, and it's not a matter of make or buy. It's a matter of we're going to buy and we're going to buy only from this vendor because we don't trust that vendor over there. So if, that, if only that vendor offers that product, I guess we're going to buy, or I'm sorry, make in that situation. So. Yeah, trust is a lot bigger deal than I guess I realized coming into this conversation. We want to hear what you all have to say about this. So find us on Twitter or Facebook at Bob and Kevin Show and uh, leave us a line or leave us a comment on the episode on iTunes or any of the other podcast networks. We really love to hear what you think about Build versus Buy. Got anything else to add here, Kevin? I just got one more thing for you, Mr. Beatty Bar, and I need you to bring the lightning.